facade is testimony to Roger's wealth and standing. In 1605, the marriage took place in Stratford of Thomas Rogers' daughter, Catherine, and Robert Harvard of Southwark. Two years later, a son, John, was born to the couple in this house. John Harvard emigrated to America in 1637, and on his death, left a large legacy to found a college in Cambridge, Massachusetts which was named Harvard College in his honour. In 1909, the freehold of John Harvard's birthplace was bought by the American millionaire Edward Morris of Chicago, who restored it and gave it to Harvard University. It was renamed Harvard House and is managed on behalf of the college by the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust. Another imposing building on the tourist trail was the Guild Chapel on the corner of Chapel Lane and Church Street. An important institution in medieval times was the Guild of the Holy Cross, who built the chapel in 1296. The Guild was made up of the most influential citizens and effectively ran the town. They financed the construction of almshouses to care for the poor and a school. The guild was disbanded in the 16th century, but the school attached to the chapel continued to teach local boys. It was here that William Shakespeare undertook his education. For centuries, Holy Trinity Church, where Shakespeare was baptised and buried, has overlooked the comings and goings on the Avon. It's thought that a small monastery stood here by the late 7th century, and the church stands close to the first Saxon settlement of Stratford. By the late 12th century, a thriving community existed around the church, but things were about to change. In 1196, King Richard I granted a charter for Stratford to hold a weekly market. With no suitable location for the market in the old village, locals chose a site a short distance to the northeast, in what is now Rother Street. Much of the trading that took place here was in livestock, and the name Rother is an Old English word meaning oxen. The location of the market shifted the focus of local life away from the old settlement around the church to the new marketplace. The first townhouses are thought to have been built in Bridge Street, between the market and the bridge, and marked the beginning of a new town. This explains why Stratford's parish church is slightly detached from the town itself and why the area around is known as Old Town. Dominating Rother Market is the elaborate clock tower presented to Stratford in 1887 by George W. Childs, a newspaper proprietor from Philadelphia. He was responding to the general opinion 
that at the time, there was no suitable monument to Shakespeare anywhere in England. The famous Gower statue didn't appear until the following year. Robert Bridgman was commissioned to erect the monument to the design of Jethro Cousins, for which a fee of £1,150 was charged. Although originally conceived as a monument to Shakespeare, its year of inauguration coincided with Queen Victoria's Jubilee, so that too was commemorated with an inscription. The design of the fountain was a celebration of the common bonds, heritage and language of the American and English people, which seems to have been particularly appreciated at the time. The fountain was unveiled on the 17th of October 1887 and the Daily News reported the proceedings. The Mayor and Corporation in their official robes accompanied by a number of distinguished guests marched in procession to the fountain where a large marquee was erected. Among those present, in addition to the Mayor Sir Arthur Hodgson and Mr Irving were Mr Phelps, the American Minister, Lord Delaware, Sir Theodore Martin, Lord Ronald Gower, Dr Macaulay and Sir Philip Cunliffe Owen. The official party then went for lunch in the town hall, where toasts were given to Queen Victoria, Shakespeare, Mr Childs and Mr Irving. Although it was designed to commemorate Shakespeare, the monument is more commonly known as the American Fountain. As well as the weekly market, Stratford was also granted the right to hold an annual three-day fair. The event became well known as a hiring fair, to which farmers, tradesmen and householders came to choose their servants for the coming year. It was customary for those seeking employment to indicate their trade. Carters and wagoners wore a piece of whipcord twisted around their hats. Thatchers, a fragment of woven straw. Shepherds held their crooks and domestic maids their mops. Stratford's traditional autumn fair is still known as the mop. In the early 20th century, the traditional purpose of the Stratford mop declined and it became a fun fair with sideshows, rides and roundabouts. The widespread fame of the Stratford mop is summed up in this description of the 1907 fair in the Stratford Herald. If any proof were wanting, it was afforded on Saturday last that the mop exhibits no signs of deterioration. On the contrary, its attractions become more supreme and bring an increased number of visitors. Fine weather favoured the event and the result was an enormous attendance. The after midday trains from London, Birmingham, Leamington, Evesham and Redditch were crowded and one continuous stream of people wended its way for two hours from the Great Western Railway Station to the centre of the fair. A special tradition is that after the Mayor has read the customary proclamation at Market Cross, the Master of the Mop escorts the Civic Party on an inspection of the fair, and on whatever ride the Mayor goes, all children from the town may go free of charge for that morning. The week after the mop, another traditional aspect of the fair is upheld, with a scaled-down version of the original hiring fair. This was where workers who found their employment unsuitable gathered to find another job. It's known as the runaway mop. Adding to the atmosphere of the fairs were the numerous pig and ox roasts that were customary outside public houses as the landlord's contribution to the festivities. For many years, the town's pubs were closely associated with one of its best-known businesses. Flower's Brewery was founded in 1831 by Edward Flower, and by the 1930s was operating from premises on the Birmingham Road. The fine ales turned out at the brewery, owed much to the quality of the local water, drawn from two artesian wells. At its peak, flowers employed around 300 people at their Stratford brewery, making it the largest employer in town.
Another of Stratford's attractions is, of course, the River Avon. Strolling alongside it, or messing about on it, have long been popular pastimes, and it provides a picturesque setting for the theatre and Holy Trinity Church. But the river means far more to Stratford than a recreational facility. The town began as a settlement at a point where a Roman road crossed the Avon at a natural ford. This was the Street Ford, from which the town takes its name. In 1639, a scheme to make the 44 miles of the Avon navigable from Stratford to the Severn at Tewkesbury was completed. The river now provided a major route for the carriage of goods from Stratford and its Warwickshire hinterland to the Severn, and thence to Bristol and the continent. Stratford's waterborne transport links improved further after 1793, when an Act of Parliament granted the cutting of a canal from Birmingham to join the Avon. It met the river at the Bancroft, which, since early days, had been where the town's poor had kept their pigs and poultry. It now became a hive of commercial activity, with wharves, warehouses and a bustling waterfront. In 1823, a horse-drawn tramway was built to carry coal and corn between Morton and the Marsh and the wharves at Stratford. The tramway bridge is now a pedestrian walkway. After the arrival of the railway in 1859, canal and river trade dwindled and both navigations deteriorated to such an extent that they were impassable to commercial traffic. When this film was taken, the only boats on the river in Stratford were the flotilla of small pleasure boats. The Avon navigation and the canal were restored in the 1960s and 70s, so that boats can once again pass through Stratford to and from the Severn. A rare sight these days is people swimming in the Avon, which had been a popular pastime since time immemorial. In 1935, the facilities to enjoy this age-old pursuit were improved, with riverside changing rooms, a water chute and a diving board. The facilities were closed in the 1950s during a polio scare, but many local people will recall lazy summer days spent cooling off in the Avon. Modern youngsters head for the more sanitised environment of the town swimming pool. One feature of the river that has survived is the Chain Ferry, seen here in 1947. The service began in 1937 to carry people across to the recreation ground where a number of new facilities were being developed. The sight of mute swans on the Avon is probably as old as the town itself, although their status has changed somewhat over time. They were once considered not as wildlife to be protected, but as the property of the local corporation and a prized source of food. Every year, two signets were caught and prepared for the Mayor's Feast, where they appeared on the menu alongside tongues, pigeon pies, ducks and geese. Swans could be purchased from the corporation for one guinea per signet and were also presented as gifts to individuals or other town councils. These gifts were usually in response to a request 
and there seems to have been a certain mystique surrounding Stratford swans. In order to maintain their exclusive right to the swans, it was necessary to mark them in some way. The proper term for this procedure is swan upping, but it was consistently referred to locally as swan hopping. The method of marking the swans was to use a sharp steel punch to perforate a small hole in the web of the left foot. As this could heal over, it was necessary to catch all of the birds each year to see if remarking was needed. The birds were also pinioned to ensure that they remained in Stratford. Up until the early 20th century, the annual swan hopping was a popular event, and from the reports in the Stratford Herald, we can get a good idea of what was involved. Every August or September, the swan hopping party would assemble at Bridgefoot or the Unicorn Dock, and would consist of the Mayor, the Borough Chamberlain, various councillors, mace bearers, the Beadle, Superintendent of Police, the Vicar of Holy Trinity Church, the Headmaster of King Edward VI Grammar School, and other gentlemen and ladies of Stratford.